Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Hope. My name is Lindsay Cordy, and I am the family minister here at Hope. I lead our children's ministry team. You can see the kids walking by behind us. And we are so glad that you are joining for worship to us. Good morning, worship. Lindsay. Good yeah, morning, good morning, Pat. everybody. Uh, welcome to Hope Online, and we're so glad that you've joined us today. My name is Pastor Pat. I'm the evangelism and outreach pastor, and I help people who are coming to Hope for the first time kind of move around the circle of hope from maybe seeker to believer. And we're so glad that you have joined us this morning. It's a beautiful fall here, day here in Des Moines. It is. It is gorgeous outside. And if you are new to Hope or to the area, we would love to connect with you. We would love to help you get plugged in. As Pat said, he helps people kind of move around our Hope Circle, find their place here. And we would love to chat with you. So feel free to call us this week. And we would love to share with you about some of the classes that we have going on and help you find your place at Hope, whether that's in person or online. Yeah. And if you're just out of the area, of course, uh, we're thinking and praying for you. But if you are out of the area, the one thing that is so be great about uh, being a believer in Christ is that we can pray for one another and lift each other up no matter where we are. And there's many ways that you can be supported and cared for. Uh, one is to go to our prayer wall on the website. You can post a prayer uh, that is maybe uplifting, but maybe you're going through one of those seasons where it's challenging. Challenging. Those prayers are met, uh, met and read uh, all the time throughout the day and week. And so if you want to go there uh, and place a prayer request, we would love to pray for you. And we pray for this season that God will provide. Uh, if you're in need of more specific care or prayer, um, you can you can send our care team an immediate email by going to care at hopewdm.org. And uh, we will we'll take those prayer requests and those care needs and we'll follow up this week. It's not hard to worry about things, yeah, right? right. <laughs> when you look yeah. at the world and all the things that are going on, it is so easy to worry. But we believe that God has a message for us in our worry today. Right. We are finishing up the our sermon series right now called Seven Habits of Highly Effective Christians. And it is going to be an awesome message today that I think every single person can use. So we are praying for your heart today as you prepare to hear that message. And if you've missed any of the other six habits that we have been talking about over the past several weeks, I'd encourage you to check those out on our website, on our YouTube page, set an alert to make sure that you're notified of all of the awesome content that goes out in those places. Uh, because we don't want you to miss any of the good things that God has for us. Yeah, a tool that gets underutilized uh, is our watch sermons feature on the website. That's you right. can actually drop down and, and type out a theme or uh, find a, a topic or area that you want to study and it'll populate a number of sermons over the last couple of years that our campus pastors and uh, pastors here at Hope have uh, preached uh, and that way you have, an op you have a study tool and an opportunity to go back and maybe catch some of those favorites or if you're walking with somebody who's going through a difficult season they can find um, uh, an opportunity to touch base with them and there's also another, another couple opportunities uh, our youth, our Power Life and Ignition talk points are always on that YouTube channel. And so I encourage you to subscribe and it'll give you alerts for when we're having Sunday church. That's right. Very good. Uh, we have been praying for the people who have been affected by Hurricane Helene in the southeast corner of the country. The devastation there is truly incredible. And so we just want to say thank you to all of you who have provided a special offering. 100% of the offering that is going to that disaster relief is going directly to Convoy of Hope, our mission partner there, because they still have boots on the ground and there is still a lot of work to be done. So thank you so much for your generous support of that ministry. Yeah, we're definitely keeping up the victims and the families who've been affected by that. The pictures and devastation is more than we can even imagine. So we lift you guys up if you're tuning in uh, and for all the uh, first care responders that are caring for those needs. Uh, finally, uh, we are celebrating the Lord's Supper today, this weekend. And so if you have the opportunity to grab some grape juice and some crackers, we'd love to share that uh, sacrament with you after today's service. Pastor Mike will share and bless the, the communion meal. And uh, we know that God is going to be present in, with, and under that. So uh, we want to just say thank you for joining us here today. Hope you enjoy this service. Uh, it's a good morning to open up the windows, uh, let the cold air in, and uh, sing your praises. That's right. We are so glad you joined us today. Welcome to Hope. Let's head in for worship. Good morning, Hope. So glad that you're here worshiping with us. It's great to see all of you. Let's stand together and let's worship and sing about what we believe about this God we serve. Come on, let's sing it together. I believe there is one salvation, one door. 
together we are going to sing a song about waiting and how we can wait well by putting our hope and our trust and our faith in God and who he is and his word father spirit and son we have this tendency to worry while we wait whatever whatever we're waiting for something great something we're scared of we just have this tendency to worry about the outcome about the circumstance God has something better for us he says to put our hope in him and in his word, he will give us his peace, church. Let's make this our prayer.
thank you that you hold us in your hand. Father, thank you that we never have to look far to run to your arms. Jesus, whatever we're waiting for today, that healing, that physical recovery, that personal transformation, that ability to forgive the one that seems impossible to forgive, that baby we've been waiting for. Thank you that you see us, that you know our deepest desires. Spirit, come and do what only you can do. God, we love you. And it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray and together we say, amen. Please take a seat. This is Hope 360, your weekly look around Lutheran Church of Hope. We see God on the move through various ways around hope in our worship and serving both inside and outside the church walls by taking a class and also do the hundreds of small groups meeting every day of the week. One of the best ways to grow in your faith is through finding a community to grow with. So if you haven't yet found your small group, we encourage you to take advantage of a great opportunity with Hope Groups Kickoff. If you're looking to get into a small group that meets off site for connection, prayer, Bible study, and serving together, check out Hope Groups Kickoff, which starts on October 14th. In this four-week class, you'll meet new people, form a group, and make a plan for continuing on together once the class is over. So we hope to see you there. Go to the small group section on Hope's website under the Get Involved tab to register. Daily quiet time with God through prayer or reading the Bible is such an important thing. So much so that we want to make sure all kids are equipped to dive into God's Word by gifting them with the Bible. All third graders and their parents are invited to join us Monday, October 7th at 6 p.m. for our next third grade Bible class. During third grade Bible class, everyone will receive their own Bible with a pen and a highlighter. Then the teacher will show everyone sections of the Bible. There is a section in the back where you can look up words on how you are feeling and find verses that talk about that topic. Parents have a special opportunity to present this Bible to their child. And after the class, they will receive a 52-week devotional series to work on together at home as they walk alongside their child during this important faith milestone. Sign up today. Another great year-long opportunity for the youth in our church is Girls for God and Face to Face. Fourth and fifth grade girls and boys are invited to join us for faith, fellowship, and fun. High schoolers will serve as mentors, and each month we'll have a different theme and a tasty treat. I think it's really important to develop mentorships because I remember when I was a little kid that I would always look up to the students that were mentoring me. The seeds that they planted in me would really help me to get to where I am right now. I enjoy leading the fourth and fifth graders because I love their different personalities and how much they get to grow in God and I get to see them grow up. Girls for God and Face to Face meet the second Saturday of each month from October 12th to April 12th from 7 to 8 p.m. Go to the calendar on our website for more info and to register. Lastly, a quick reminder to mark your calendars for an awesome morning of inspirational networking and community focused on shining your light in the workplace. Our next God's Heart at Work event is set for Thursday, October 17th at 7 a.m. and begins with a 45-minute networking opportunity followed by remarks from Pastor Mike and a panel presentation. All are invited, so grab your colleagues and join us. That was your 360-degree look around Lutheran Church of Hope. We're glad you joined us and welcome to Hope. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Hope. My name is Lindsay Cordy, and we are so glad to be worshiping with you today. Yeah, my name is Pastor Pat, and I, like uh, we are joyful that we have got the opportunity to gather on this wonderful, beautiful morning. And uh, if this is your first time visiting with us, or maybe you've been with us for several seasons of life, we've been praying for you, and we think it's no accident you're here. Our staff, our pastors, congregation members, our prayer teams, we don't think it's any accident that God has you here today. 
That's right. And as you saw in Hope 360 today, there is a ton of great stuff going on for people of all ages. So whether you are two or 92, there is a place for you here at Hope. I would challenge you, even if you've been coming to Hope for years, to check out our website this week. Refresh yourself on all of the amazing opportunities, the classes, the programs that are here for you, and pray about what God might be leading you to in this season of life. If the website isn't your thing, you can call the church and we would love to have a conversation with you, get to know you a little bit and help you plug in because there's a place for everyone here. Lastly, if this is your first time visiting with us today, a special welcome to you. Uh, I want to invite you after service today uh, to stop by that orange New to Hope area uh, just outside of the worship center. Uh, re as coming today, we want to give and share with you a gift, a t-shirt, but also we would love to answer some of your questions. And if you have a certain specific ministries that you're looking forward to in your season of life, we would love to share those opportunities with you as well. At this time, I'd invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Gracious God, thank you so much for this day that you've made. God, thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather as a church family to worship you, to praise you, and to learn more about your deep love. So Father, right now we invite you into our hearts. We invite you to be opening our hearts to hear a message of love and joy and deep peace today. Father, whether we are on the mountaintop or in the valley, you are here with us, Lord. So we say thank you for your presence and thank you for your love. And Lord, we pray all of this in the matchless name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Our service continues with this opportunity to remind you of the opportunity that this ministry doesn't happen without the support and gifts of all of us coming together. And so there's a number of ways to give. You can see those opportunities on the screen above, but you can also give in this room with the secured boxes as you go on out uh, for the day. And last weekend, we, we had some ideas of the effects of the hurricane that it hit uh, here in the United States, but we didn't have a lot of the images or a lot of the personal stories that we're seeing today and understand the tremendous loss. And so this weekend, there are opportunities to give uh, cash uh, offerings uh, by the New to Hope area in those boxes, secured boxes. 100% of your gifts uh, go to help with those efforts with Convoy of Hope. You can also give online as well. But let's continue to lift up those victims and their families and all of the relief workers that are helping to bring back life uh, into those communities. Our service continues now with our Bible reading. Our Bible reading is from the New Testament, Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Here ends today's reading. What is that? Laughter is contagious, they say, so I kind of thought I'm just going to show that video for 30 minutes and just kind of run it over and over and over again until we all kind of get it contagious in, into us and laugh. Uh, we're, you heard in our Bible reading just a minute ago that Mia read so well from Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say it, rejoice. Paul's writing this from the dirt floor of a prison cell awaiting his execution, which gives us a clue to realize that joy, the source of our joy, the source of our happiness has to come from a source that's far deeper. That's far deeper than just our circumstances, than whatever might be happening around us. 
The video was of my grandson, our grandson Miles, who is in Charlotte, and he was reading a new Halloween book uh, that we sent that has little pumpkins on it, and for some reason, the eek pumpkin, pumpkin with the funny look on his face made Miles just laugh uncontrollably, just hilariously. He, he continues to, even when we call him now, we'll say, Miles, eek, <laughs> you'll start laughing, you'll start cracking up again, the dimples come out, the whole deal. It's, it's Miles, he's a happy kid. Even when his big sisters give him a kiss on the cheek, that'll change. I'm sure that'll change as the years go by, but, but for now, he's really excited about just about everything. Be full of joy, Paul says, always. Again, I'll say it, rejoice. So over here, I, I brought the whiteboard out today, but I really am only going to put a few words up here just to kind of remind us what we're trying to get. I mean, aren't all of us looking for more joy and more peace in this life and in this world? And yet, along comes this challenging, consistent, burdensome thing called worry. And worry threatens to steal our joy and steal our peace. And so I want to call this sermon, How to Wipe Out Worry. It's part of our Seven Habits of Highly Effective Christian series that we're wrapping up today. There it is on the bottom line, How to Wipe Out Worry. If you want to catch up, if you're new to Hope today and say, well, I missed the first six, you can get all those on Hope's YouTube channel uh, anytime you want. All of them relate and they all lead one to another. In fact, wiping out worry has a whole lot to do with applying the six other habits. I preached on worry, this, I've been preaching here for over 30 years, and I think I've preached at least 30 sermons on worry because it's a constant issue in our world today, and it's an oft-repeated phrase in the Bible. In fact, the most repeated phrase in the Bible is don't worry, don't be afraid. Love one another is the most important commandment, but the most repeated phrase, and I think it's because God knows we need to be reminded over and over and over again is do not worry. So what are you worried about today? What is it that's stealing your joy and your peace? There are uh, surveys of Americans, the Gallup poll came out not that long ago and said Americans are worried about money and they're worried about the, the national debt and the deficit and they're worried about being able to afford health care and they're worried about wars and rumors of war and, and, and violence on our streets and they're worried about grieving and mourning the death of a loved one, and, and we're worried about uh, missing out, FOMO, the fear of missing out, uh, having one piece of the puzzle that isn't there, that, that, that we miss something. We have worries about the upcoming election. We have worries about every election. We, we always do. We, we, we tend to worry about these things that we can't fully control, we can participate in, but we can't control. Uh, we worry about what might happen to family. We worry about relationships. We worry, the number one or number two uh, is surveyed worry of Americans consistently over and over and over again is public speaking. <laughs> And this is true. I, I found this to be true, that, that standing up in front of a crowd of people and, and speaking to them, I don't want to talk about it anymore. Let's just move on. I don't want worry to steal my joy and my peace today. Before we move on, though, I want to pause and give a word because some of you already probably if I saw the bubbles up above your head you'd be like yeah but what about diagnosed anxiety what what, what about a medical condition what what about people who truly struggle are we just supposed to tell them oh don't worry be happy it, it, the most repeated phrase in the bible is don't be afraid does that mean they don't have faith of course not there's good worry too I mean, it would be good to worry about blasting off on a rocket like Johnny Knoxville in that TV show that was named after a donkey. That, 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 he doesn't worry enough. He should be worried about doing this. And good worry is the thing that we teach our kids. Hey, don't touch the hot stove. You're going to get burned. You're going to get hurt. It's, there is good worry. It's the worry that keeps us from danger. It's, it keeps us from being harmed. But there's also... A, an attitude of uh, hakuna matata, which is really fun, and it's nice, and it's Bobby McFerrin's Don't Worry, Be Happy, would fit with that too, that song from the 80s, or was it the 90s? And that's nice, and it's kind of, you know, a, a fantasy that if, if we just had a positive attitude, if we just, if we just made lemon out of lemonade, le lemons out of Lemonade out of lemons. That if we just did that. If, if, we just, if we just kind of flipped the script and, and made everything better. And any other pithy phrase that you want to come up with. But 
It just isn't going to cut it for people who have real world worries. So I'm not talking about the kinds of worries that are good worries that keep us from harm and from danger. Or the things that are worth being concerned about. Not worried, but concerned about. Because worry implies that we don't have faith. I'm talking about the daily worries that can paralyze us, that that trap us, that threaten to steal joy and peace from us. For that, the Bible says, you have to make a choice. I have to make a choice. Are we going to cower in fear and retreat, or are we going to step forward in faith? If we know God is with us, if we know God is leading us, if we know we aren't alone, when I am afraid, Psalm 56, 3 says, I'm going to put my trust in you, God. I'm going to put my trust in you. So let's take a 30,000 foot view of Philippians 4 uh, 4 again. This is my favorite verse in the whole Bible. A lot of times if I'm uh, sending a card on Confirmation Sunday to somebody who gets confirmed here, I'll I'll sign my name and I'll put underneath it Philippians 4.4. Maybe you got one of those for me. It's my favorite verse. And it's my favorite verse not because Paul's saying, hey, pep talk, everybody be happy, try to stop worrying. It's because it's so deeply rooted and grounded in something significant, a source of strength that is untapped for far too many of us. Remember, Paul's writing this facing his death, and he wasn't worrying about something that wasn't going to happen. He would, in fact, be executed for his Christian faith, and he knew it was so. He knew it was coming. And yet, when he sat down to write about it, he didn't say, Woe is me. Oh, this is terrible. This is the worst thing ever. It's it's terrible injustice. All that was true. But what did he choose to write? Rejoice with me. I'll say it in case you missed it, Paul says. Again, I'll tell you, rejoice. And so I've always been intrigued. Where does that source of strength come from? What, what, What causes Paul to be able to say, I've got joy. I've got the joy, joy, joy. Do you know that one? I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Where? Okay, I'm going to stop there because some of us don't. I don't think you're, I'm, I'm not feeling it yet from you. So maybe we aren't tapping into the deeper source. Maybe we're expecting joy to depend on how our day's going, how our week's going, how this season of life is going. And I'm telling you from experience, but more so from what, biblical wisdom teaches us that's a horrible uh, a way to, to connect our cart to that horse. It's not going to lead us where we want to go. If you want joy, untouchable joy, if you want a peace that passes all human understanding, which is also in these four verses from Philippians 4, that will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, We're going to have to dig down deeper. We're going to have to find something more. Always be full of joy in the Lord. Then you'll experience God's peace that exceeds anything we can understand. If that's what we want, here's the big threat. Here's the issue in the middle. It's the day-to-day worries. It's the things that creep up. Jesus talks about this in his famous parable of the sower. He says a sower, a farmer, goes out to farm and he throws the seeds around. And some of the seed, the good news is at the end of the parable, some of the seed is good seed, that's God's word, Jesus says, that falls on good soil, that's receptive souls in us. And when God's word hits receptive souls, it produces an abundant harvest up to a hundred times the size of that seed. And it feeds the world. It produces a crop not just for the seed itself, but for everything around it. That's the beauty. That's the miracle of, that's, that's the miraculous growth that the Holy Spirit provides through faith, through the heart and soul of a believer who lives their lives for the cause of Jesus Christ. But Jesus also talks about some of the seed that fell on a hard pathway and it was taken by the birds and some of the seed that that didn't take root. And so at first it's like, yay, yay God, I'm all excited. I've come to faith. This is awesome. But it doesn't take root. It doesn't go down deep. And so when the worries and cares of this world come, the seeds that sown around the thorny ground, the thorns capture it and, and stunt the growth and paralyze the joy and the peace. They steal joy and peace, Jesus says. It's the worries and the cares of this world. It's the illusion of of wealth, thinking that that's what we really need in order to be wholly happy. But we're going to actually need way more than that. And wealth is going to come and go anyway, and it's not going to last. Don't worry about anything, Paul says. 
so that you don't get your joy and peace stolen. But I'm going to highlight a few things in green. We'll take these one at a time. Since I've preached on this at least 30 times in 30 years, I thought, I'm, just for my own like, interest, I want to take a different approach and a different angle on this. And so I want to tell you about three things that are kind of hidden in this text. We hear the word joy. We see the word peace. Passes all understanding. That would be great. So we want joy, yay, down in our hearts to stay. Woo! We want the peace that passes all human understanding. We're worried about the worry. <laughs> We're like, oh, we got to get rid of the worry. I get that. We need to get rid of this. We need to wipe out worry to have more joy and to have more peace. But how? It's hidden. It's the stuff that we don't always see, especially the first one, which is what Paul says, let everyone see that you are considerate. Turn to the person next to you, wherever you are, whatever local site or campus or here in West Des Moines, watching online at a, at a youth football game on a Sunday morning which should not be happening, but that's okay. That's another sermon for another day. Turn to the person next to you and say, be considerate. <laughs> Some of you are like, tell me to say that again to my spouse or my kid who's sitting next to me. Be considerate. Let everyone see that you're considerate in all that you do. Our daughter, Christy, told us about this TV show that she wanted us to watch called Outlast. And she said, you can skip over season one because season two is really good. And she said, Dad, I think it's got some preaching material for you. And I'm like, I'm in. Let's go. It's sort of a ripoff of Survivor, a spinoff. It's on Netflix. And it, the, the gist of the show, if you haven't seen it, most people haven't, is they have 16 contestants from all over America who come to Alaska, to the wild of Alaska. They give them minimal amounts of survival tools, uh, just a few little things, and that's it. And they say, okay, you got 45 days. 45 days, and the one rule is you have to be on a team. You can't go alone. There's no lone wolves, no lone rangers here. The only way you can win is if you're on a team, and whichever team outlasts all the other teams wins $1 million. A $1 million. So here's some of the characters on the show, and this is my favorite. His name is Joseph. He's from Lafayette, Louisiana. And as we see over time, at first you start to look at him and you're like, well, he's quiet, he's kind of reserved, he maybe isn't the most equipped person for some of the other contestants or survivalists, and here's Brendan down here, he's from central Idaho, he lives in a town that's about 15 miles away from the town where I was born, so I was kind of drawn to him. He's a trapper for a living. He, 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 that, he's, out, he's an outdoorsman. He's, he's living outside all the time d doing the thing that he does. A whole lot of the other contestants are the same. But Joseph, the hero for me of the whole show, he's a mechanic. And he's there for who knows what reason. But you start to realize there's a quiet confidence in him. I would even suggest there's a joy in him. There's a peace in him calm in him that doesn't just come because he's having a good day. Everybody out there in this show is having bad days. For 45 days, they're hungry, they're cold, they're wet, they're trying to figure out what they're supposed to do, they're dealing with their, their teammates, trying to, trying to get along, try, trying to, they, they had, it's not like they said, well, here's your campground, this is where you can set up. They said, here's a couple of canvases and that, not even a tent, and you're going to have to chop your own trees down and make your own shelters and, and pick your own places. Joseph just kind of rolls with it. And then as the episodes develop in season two, you start to realize, oh, that's the source of his joy. That's the source of his peace. It's Jesus. He's a man of faith. As the episodes move on, and I give them credit in this show, because a lot of times they try to push this away and hide it, if people of faith come on these shows, but they didn't. They put it out there. He says, I'm a man of God. I'm a person who does things like this. And that really starts to play out toward the end. When this guy right here, this is Joseph and this is Joey. Don't be confused. <laughs> Joey is a complicated guy. We all are on certain levels. But Joey's trying so hard to get the million dollars, he's willing to betray his team. These three are on the same team. And they're one of the last two teams left at the end, about a day or two to go. And Joey looks at his team and says, I don't think we're going to win. I think the other team across the water is going to win. So he sneaks off in a boat 
And he goes off to the other team to try to campaign for them to draft him, Joey, onto their team so that he can split the million dollars with them. Well, the other team wants nothing to do with Joey because they are greedy and they want to keep their bigger chunk of the million dollars and they don't want a third wheel coming along and, and taking a chunk of their million dollar prize because they think they're going to win. And in fact, spoiler alert, if you don't want to hear the next part, plug your ears. Joey's right. That's the team that's going to win. The two dudes from Texas who treat women like second-class citizens, and I don't think they know the Lord yet. You can kind of tell because they kicked off a third person on their team a couple of days before the last day just so they could get more money for themselves. And they manipulated the whole conversation in order to do it and weren't completely honest with him about why he shouldn't continue on. So their motive is money. What's yours? What's your thing that's going to give you joy? that's going to give you life, that's going to give you meaning and purpose, that's going to give you peace? Is it something deeper than material things, than the deceitfulness, as Jesus says in his parable of the sower, the deceitfulness of wealth? Are you rooted? Is it good seed hitting good soil so that it's deeply rooted, so that when the storms of life come, when the worries hit, you're like, well, this isn't good, but I've got a I've got a root system, I, I, I've, got a, I've got a foundation, I'm strong in the Lord. That's Joseph. And that's Brendan too, who's also a man of faith. Well, Joey betrays his team and they find out about it and they send Joseph, because he's a peaceful guy, down to talk to Joey. And Brendan's there at the end too, listening in. I want you to ask yourself, what would I do if a teammate of mine betrayed our team. Cancel him, be done with him, say you're out, you blew it, or offer him just a little bit of the same grace that God gives to you and to me. Take a look. Justice is important and there's Certainly a central place for justice in the way we interact with one another. As followers of Jesus Christ, justice is a part of the equation. But justice without grace, justice without mercy, it's going to steal our joy. It's going to steal our peace. It isn't ultimately, first and foremost, what we're called to be as followers of Jesus Christ. Justice warriors, sure. But always speaking our truth and love. Always turning the other cheek. Always doing what the Bible says over and over and over again. And it is one of the habits of highly effective Christians. That we will be people of forgiveness. That we will be people of grace for one another. That doesn't mean that we become doormats and allow abusers to come back in and abuse us over and over again. And just keep repeating cycles to prove just how gracious we are and how wonderful we are. That's when it's time for justice. There are times, there are times when people step outside of the boundaries, but, but somebody who uh, is deceitful and is, is, is kind of stabbing some backs on his team, well, I think what Joseph saw in Joey was, what would happen if we redeemed him? Well, it messed Joey up. <laughs> Grace messes people up in a really good way. Grace turns lives around. I mean, that's the only hope we have for heaven, is that if there is a God who loves us so much that he would send his son to die for us on a cross, and that he would rise from the dead to raise us who are joined to him with even the tiniest mustard seed of faith to a new and an everlasting life. God doesn't just say, offer grace for one another. Jesus doesn't just say at the heart of the Lord's Prayer that he taught us to, to, to pray, which we'll pray in just a few minutes before communion. Forgive us our trespasses, our sins, God. We want that. We want your grace. But what's the next line? As we forgive those who trespass or sin against us. It's a package deal. Because we've received God's grace, he wants it to pour out of us to the world around us. For us to offer grace for those who've done us wrong. For us to offer grace even before people have earned it. It's not grace by definition if people have to earn it for, the, for us to give it to them. 
for us to offer. It, it doesn't mean we have to like what was done to us. We, we, we've talked about that during this series too. It doesn't mean you have to turn a blind eye to it and pretend it's all good. It doesn't mean you have to open the door to be a doormat, like I said before. What it means is you're going to let it go. I'm going to let it go. We're going to practice grace for the other. This is what the Christian life looks like. And there's a Greek word here that's worth diving into a little bit deeper. Let everyone, Paul says, right after he says rejoice, again I'll say it, rejoice. Here's how you do it. Let everyone see that you're considerate. Epia case in the Greek. Epia case in all that you do. Epia case in its literal definition. It doesn't just mean considerate, it means consideration that isn't deserved. That we offer gentleness and kindness and love and grace for those who haven't earned it, for those who haven't received it. That's how you get joy, Paul says. The very first thing he says about how can somebody who's living on the dirt floor of a prison cell writing this letter to the church in Philippi, facing his execution, how can he say authentically, rejoice with me? Where does his joy come from? It comes from offering grace. First and foremost, from reflecting the same light of God's amazing grace that he gives to us, to the world around us. Let everyone see that you have that. Live it out. And then our joy and peace won't get stolen. Let's take a broader look again at Philippians 4. So here it is, the joy and the peace that we want. Be considerate in all you do because the Lord is coming soon. God watches us. He sees us. He knows what's happening. It, 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 live like it matters because it does. Every interaction that you and I have with, with others, every time we get into a conversation, every time we have an opportunity to help or to serve or to forgive, God sees it. Not sees it as some Santa Claus who's keeping a list of, of who's naughty and who's nice, but as a God of grace for us who made us for something more than keeping score. The same Apostle Paul will write in 1 Corinthians 13, love, if it's really Christ-centered love, the kind of love that'll set us free, that will allow us to recapture the joy and the peace that's been stolen for us. Love for one another does not keep score. It does not keep a record of wrongs. It does not say, oh, well, you, you've done too much. You're out. That, that's it. You, you, that, I, I, I can't have any grace or love for you anymore because you offended me, because of some daily offense that came my way. Well, that's it. Anybody offends me, they're out. I know that sounds good to the world, and I know it's a defense mechanism, but what does it produce? Loneliness, bitterness, cynicism, frustration, disillusionment, anger, because we weren't wired up for that. We were wired up for grace. We were wired up to offer love and to not keep score and to be patient and kind and considerate in a grace-based way. So if we have this joy and this peace that's coming back because we know God wants us to live this life, that he's coming soon. It, it, we're, the time is coming soon, Jesus says, over and over and over again in the Bible. So don't wait. Don't wait to start applying these seven habits of highly effective Christians. The second thing is the more common thing, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but you can't preach a sermon on worry without mentioning prayer, because Paul puts them straight together. He says, don't worry about anything. Everyone say anything. Think of all the anythings you're worried about. That's not a happy thought, is it? What did you wake up thinking about this morning? What was the first worry that came to mind? What, what, what was the last thing you thought about last night when you went to sleep? Was it a worry? What, was it a concern? Was it a care? Or was it, it's Cyclone Celebration Sunday again. This is a happy, happy day. What, what, what is it you're worried about? What is it that's, that's stealing your joy? That's taking you away from the life that God created you to live? So that you could even be facing your own death and say, yeah, but I still have joy. And it isn't fake. It isn't a, hey, I'm going to pretend I have joy. I'm going to put on a happy face and a half an inch underneath the surface. I'm just devastated. That you could have joy from the inside out. That you could have joy from the very essence of your being, your core, and then it would come straight out of you. Paul says, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Everyone say everything. 
So we don't worry about those anythings, that worry, but we pray about it all. We give it to God. There's a Greek word for worry that gets repeated over and over in the Bible, not just in Philippians 4, but in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. In fact, four times in just nine verses, Jesus says, don't worry. Don't be worried about these things. And the Greek word is merimnao, which means having an a, 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 a episode where you feel like you're falling apart, that you're going to pieces. That's the biblical definition of worry. That's the outcome. That's the product of it. Or that we're getting distracted. We should be focused over here, but we're focused on our worries. And smartphones have a lot to do with that, sadly. Study after study after study has been done that shows the more we use our smartphones, the more we scroll through over and over and over again, the more anxiety it's going to produce. The more it's going to steal joy, the more it's going to steal peace. Oh, there's, there's good things in those smartphones too, to be sure. All sorts of good things. But when it distracts us from what we're supposed to be doing, like this guy apparently should be studying for a test, when it distracts us from something more important, it's not going to produce the outcome we want. And so merim na'o means coming to pieces. It means going to pieces. It means falling apart. Prayer is the way we come back together. When I stand up here every summer at Vacation Bible School, I don't know it, when it happened. I think it was the Holy Spirit. But I said, okay, kids, everybody hold up your right hand. Go ahead and do that. If I can teach it to three-year-olds, I can teach it back to you. Hold up your right hand and say, this is my God hand. Wave it around. Turn to the person next to you and say, talk to the hand. No, don't do that. It's my God hand. Everybody hold up your other hand and say, it's my me hand. And I say, let's pray. Let's put them together. Oh, look what happens when we pray. God and me, God and you, you come back together. It's the opposite of worry. Worry, we, we fall apart. We go to pieces. It takes over. It can dominate. It can ruin a day. It can ruin a week. It can ruin a season of life. Prayer is this beautiful, powerful antidote that brings things back together. And so Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, always be joyful. Never stop praying. That's how you do it. Surrender it to God, for this is God's will for you. Here's a little chart on the next screen that kind of sums this up. This is the part we should be focusing on, the, the part that's colored in in the middle. This is the stuff we can't control in this circle over here. And these are the things that matter over here. The stuff we should focus on are the things that we can control and the things that matter. All the things that matter that we can't control, I mean all the things that you can control, we got to do, the day-to-day -day tedious tasks of life, but the things that matter that we can't control, this is where most of our worries reside. Give those to God so you don't go to pieces, so that God and you stay real close, that you stay real tight. So number one, be considerate which is the big surprise, how to have joy. Be considerate. Don't be selfish, don't be self-absorbed, but be um, selfless. Be, be forgiving, be giving, be loving. P point in an outward direction and you'll realize, oh, I was made for this. <laughs> this doesn't just bless the other person, this blesses me. This re re it keeps me from getting my joy and my peace stolen. Number two, pray so that we don't fall apart, so that we come back together. And finally, number three, it's this little hidden three-letter, three-word phrase that is probably the most important phrase in this entire text from Scripture. Rejoice in the Lord. Always be jo full of joy in the Lord. Everyone say, in the Lord. Shout it out. Say, in the Lord. There you go, we're back here again, aren't we? So keep the faith. And if you don't have faith, take a closer look. Because this is the key to joy and a peace that passes all human understanding. Martha and Mary came over to Jesus, or Jesus came to their house one day, the sisters of Lazarus, who he will raise from the dead later. But here in Luke chapter 10, everybody's still alive, doing fine. So he goes to his friend's house and there's, there's Mary and she's sitting down at the feet of Jesus and worshiping Jesus. Here's Jesus in this modern art depiction and here's Mary worshiping, doing what you and I are doing here today, making time to do what we've been wired up to do, not just for the sake of keeping a commandment, but keeping the commandment because it's for our sake. It's for our benefit. We were made for this. Martha is busy. 
And I, I love this, the depiction of all the things that you have to do. And, and we have all the things that we have to do. But it should never get in the way of worshiping Jesus. It should never get in the way of us making time and finding time to sit down at the feet of Jesus and to be reminded of who we are and whose we are and how much our God loves us, how far he's willing to go for us, even to die on a cross, how he calls us to follow his way, a better way that leads to a deeper truth and therefore a more abundant life and we reclaim the joy and the peace that's stolen from us by the thorny ground, the, the worries of this world. So Martha complains to his sister and to Jesus because she comes out of preparing everything. Oh, we have company. Well, I'm not going to hang out with my friend, Jesus. I'm going to get to work. And I get it and people say, yeah, but somebody had to do the work. Right, I understand and there's a time for that. After worship, first things first, nothing more important than this. People will tell me, ah, I can't come to church today, got friends over from out of town. Bring them, invite them. Can't, can't come to church today, really busy week. It was homecoming last night. It was prom, there, there's a lot going on. Uh, you know, it was a big college football game this weekend. We're, we're gonna make a weekend of it. Great, fine, worship with us online. Nothing comes before this. This isn't, I, I know it, it could easily sound like, oh, well, you're just saying that because you're the pastor of the church. No, I'm saying that because Jesus says it. And it steals our peace and our joy. Martha, you're worried. Martha, you're worried. Martha, you're worried, Jesus says, and upset over all these details of life, all these things you gotta do. You know, if we don't do all these things, if our kids aren't involved in all these things, then we're going to put them behind. They're, they're not going to keep up. We're, we're, we're worried about all these. You're worried about all these things. But there's only one thing. One thing, Jesus says. What's the one thing for you? What's the one thing that nothing gets in the way of? What's the one thing on your schedule? What's the one thing that comes first in your life? What's the one thing? What comes first? There's only one thing, Jesus says, that is necessary. Only one thing worth being con concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her, Jesus says. In other words, the very strong implication, you should learn from your sister. You should learn from, I, I've heard all sorts of teaching on this as well, you can be Mary or Martha and it's all good. That's not what Jesus is saying, with all due respect. He's saying, go ahead and do the work, but not before you have communion with me. Not before you connect with me. First things first, what's the one thing for me? What's the one thing for you? And, and do we apply that? It's one thing to say, okay, I know I'm supposed to be considerate and offer grace for people and ha have a deeper understanding of consideration. It isn't just being nice. It means truly reflecting the grace God gives to me to the world around me. And that's gonna allow me to reclaim my joy and peace. And it is. I get it that worry in the Bible means falling apart, going to pieces, and prayer brings me back together with God. I'm in communication with the God of creation and the God of salvation. What a gift. What an incredible gift that is to, to reunite with our creator anytime you want. You've got a hotline. Use it because it'll, it'll help you reclaim your joy and your peace. But third, keep the faith. Stay in the Lord. Apply this teaching. Don't just know the seven habits of highly effective Christians. Don't just memorize verses from Romans 12 and Philippians 4. More important than memorizing these verses is applying them. Letting Jesus not just be Savior, but letting him be Lord. Actually applying them to my daily life, to your daily life. And then you'll know the truth, Jesus says, and this truth is going to set us free. Martha, you're worried about so many things. And so Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, he says, so don't worry. Consider the wildflowers out in the fields. Who did that? Was there a farmer out there planting those wildflowers? A gardener? Uh-uh. That was God. That was all God. 
Sometimes it's somebody planting seeds. I get it, I know. But it's God. Consider the wildflowers, Jesus says. They are taken care of. And if God takes care of the flowers of the field, how much more he's going to care for you, Jesus says. The highlight of his creation. Consider the birds, consider the ravens, Jesus says. Not a sparrow falls from the sky without God knowing about it. Won't God take even better care of you, the highlight of his creation, if he's watching over those birds as the Bible says he is? Aren't you far more valuable to God than the birds are? You are. You've got God's word on this. Now start to see your worries in a new light. The God of creation, the God of all power, the God who can create fields of wildflowers, the God who creates the animals and the birds and the, and the human beings says, you, the human being, you're the highlight. You're the ones I sent my son to die for. Consider how good I am to the rest of creation and understand how much better I'm going to be to the highlight of my creation. And then you'll know. And then you'll know. And then we finally come home could not be more excited about what's around the next corner here at Lutheran Church of Hope. This is the beginning-ish of October. Starting in November, we're going to have a building campaign. We're going to bring this church into the 21st, this church building and this property into the 21st century. And I'm not talking about just polishing some things up. I'm talking about creating holy spaces where God can bring us together in community, in love for one another, so that we can find the joy and the peace that's been stolen from us by the worries of the world, so that we can do that not just for this congregation, but for this community. You'll hear more details about that next month, but I think it's the most important thing that we could possibly do in this particular season of this church's life, is to set things up in such a way that we're gonna leave a legacy for the generations that will follow us, for those who are already here and starting to come, for the young families who flood our Hope Kids ministry every week, uh, and make it bigger than almost any elementary school in town. For, for, for all those kids, for all those families, and that's some of you. We want to create space that's ready to go for you. And not just that, but space for the community to find connections, to find peace, to find joy, to be able to wipe out worry. I've been waiting to do this the whole sermon. This is the universal symbol for it's done. It's gone. Always be full of joy in the Lord, Paul says. Rejoice. How do you get that? Be considerate of one another. Have grace for one another. Pray. Instead of going to pieces, come back together. Stop trying to control the things we can't control and surrender that in prayer to God and say, God, I trust you enough to take care of this part of my life. And then finally, keep the faith and stay in the Lord and in relationships and, and keep the focus on love. God's love for us and then our love for the world around us. At the end of this show, Joseph's team is one of the last two teams going for the million dollars. There's five people on Joseph's team. There's two people on the team that's going to win. I gave it away again. It's not. It, it's fine. There's a lot of shows you could watch. <laughs> and they're disappointed. I mean, they didn't play the game to lose. Being a Christian doesn't mean you can't try to win. It's just I wonder if we have the wrong definition of what true victory is. Mm, I don't wonder. I'm old enough to know the world has the wrong definition of what victory is. And most of us have been sucked into it. We have to teach our kids to be winners. Great. Along the way, we should also teach them to handle the defeats of life so that they won't be tossed to and fro the first time something happens that isn't perfect. The first time they face adversity, the first time they face challenges, how much time are we spending teaching that instead of, hey, just be a little champion, be, be, be number one, be, be the best? What comes first? If we really love our kids, and I know we do, the best thing we can give them is a relationship with God, because that's going to last forever. And that, if we apply it, is going to reclaim our joy and peace and wipe out worry. So Joseph and his team, they're not going to win. And it's kind of heartbreaking. 
The other team is celebrating in, in ways that you would expect the world to celebrate. We won money. We're going to be happy forever. I can almost guarantee you that 10 years from now, once the dust settles from this, the million dollars will be gone and Joseph's team will be the victors. Because they found community. They found love for one another. They discovered the meaning of life. They discovered what real joy and real peace is. And if you listen closely, I think you'll hear it. Welcome. We don't think it's any accident that you're here and we have been praying for you. To see more of our content, know when we go live and stay up to date week to week, feel free to subscribe to this channel. And if you live close by one of our campuses or local sites, we invite you to check us out in person. We would love to meet you. And don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date. See you next week.